Continuing in a series of homilies from Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, we come now to chapter 2. Hear the word of the Lord. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of the flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. We've gathered here this morning, O oh God, seeking a word from you. No mortal words will do. So be gracious to our seeking, we pray. Amen. Life is demanding. It does not matter if you are young or old, wealthy or poor, uptight or laid back we all face life's demands. And the hardest part is that these demands are not integrated. They pull us into very different directions. They're they're the demands of, of school and work and the demands of family and friends and church and the demands of volunteerism and service projects and our commitments to the community and the demands of paying the rent and and the demands of dealing with the past and preparing for the future. And it all goes in different directions. So we get discouraged. Because the the only way we know how to deal with one of these demands is to give less attention to another demand. Which means that in some area of our life, we are always a failure. Thus the discouragement. Something is always getting dropped. When I go to the grocery store by myself, I am tempted to think I don't really need a cart. (laughs) I'm just getting a few things I can easily carry. A while back, while trying to make my way to the cashier carrying way too many things in my arms, the loaf of bread dropped. As I reached to grab it, I then dropped the milk and the orange juice, then trying to get it, the coffee and the cheese and the butter fell, and then three oranges just rolled right down the aisle. (laughs) This is how you know that I'm a preacher. My very first thought was, well, that's a metaphor. (laughs) (laughs) While trying to reach to take good care of our commitments at home, we realize we are dropping behind at work, and as we try to reach to take care of that, we drop our self-care, and since whenever life gets demanding, the very first thing we do is drop the spiritual disciplines, we watch our sanity just roll on down the aisle away from us. As Jesus warned, those who try to save their lives will lose them. I very much love listening to people tell their 
stories of how faith was discovered in their life, or as some traditions refer to it, their testimonies. But most all testimonies are told in the first person. I once was lost, but now I'm found. When the Apostle Paul starts to tell our testimony in the second chapter of his letter to the Ephesians, notice that he uses the second person. Not the comfortable third person or even first plural, the second person. And he's not very tender with us. His opening words in this chapter are, you were dead. Not you were lost or you were unfulfilled, or even you were victimized. You were dead through your sin and trespasses. Sin is anything that separates us from God. Nothing will do that quite like trying to hold our lives in our own arms. You were dead. He doesn't just kill us, though. He actually digs the grave as well. Verse 2, you are following the spirit of those who are disobedient. Verse 3, you were living according to the passions of the flesh and were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. Only significantly, he now moves from the second person to the first plural. Now, your problem has become our problem. We, he says, are by nature children of wrath like everyone else. You got hurt because someone hurt you who was hurt. And the anger settles in, and after a while we carry this anger around so long, we can't do anything else but hurt those around us. My problem becomes your problem. Sin is contagious. You were dead. We have become children of wrath like everyone else. Then, then, in the same paragraph, Paul turns our testimony with the words, but God. The gospel always turns with those two words, but God. You were killing yourself trying to save yourself, but God. You were hurt a long time ago and are still walking around in the anger of it, but God. You were born into a world where the haves have so much and the have-nots have not a chance. But God. You send your children to school with no rational reason to be certain they will not be gunned down in their classrooms. You live in a society that has settled for that. But God. But God. Out of the riches of his grace, who has loved us, even though we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive in Christ Jesus, for by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You may not realize it. You may not act like it or even believe it. It doesn't matter. You have been raised and with Christ and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That's your real home. You have a seat in the heavenly places. There's a chair with your name on it. It's not just referring to where you go when you die. Any time you are living in Christ, you are bringing some of the heavenly places to this earth. 
in Christ. We looked at this phrase last week. Paul just loves this word, these two words, in Christ. I discovered this week that in the epistles attributed to him, he uses that phrase 169 times. 169 times. Now you know how preachers spend their evenings. 169 times. According to the first chapter, it means that the Holy Spirit has sealed you into the Son's beloved relationship with the Father, making you also the beloved child of God. That's who you really are. Pastors often encounter parishioners who are trying to make excuses for their sins, their temper, their cynicism. Pastor, I'm sorry I took his head off in the committee meeting, but that's just who I am. No, it's not. You, you are who God created you to be, who Christ redeemed you to be, and neither of them made you mean. You've just gotten used to pretending. Get real. Be the real you as who you are in Christ Jesus. Tragically, some of the meanest people I know are Christians who are on a mission. They set out to do something good, but they assumed that they were on their own to get it done. So they have become messianic. And when they meet up with resistance, they double their resolve and will do whatever it takes to achieve their goals, which means they inevitably start hurting people. So they are now mean messiahs. We don't need any more of those. The goal is not to imitate Christ on your own. Because when you do that, you will inevitably start hurting people because you're not the Messiah. The goal, the call, is to participate in Christ, in Christ. It's not about what you do, it's about what Christ is doing in you and through you. For by grace we have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Grace claims that life is not a challenge to be achieved. It, it, is, it is a gift to be received. And every day you have to begin by reminding yourself whether or not you are going to confront this great choice. Will you try to achieve your life or receive your life today? If you make achieving your life the goal, your constant companion will be complaint because you will never achieve enough. If you make receiving life your goal, your constant companion will be gratitude for all that Christ is doing for you and through you for those around you. Grace claims that it does not matter what you have done or left undone. It does not matter what was done to you. It does not matter how dark and despairing the day may seem. There is always the gospel. There is always but God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.